Paper Series. We meet every Monday in this room at this time. Um, and you can go to the website, beck.ucla.edu, to see a lineup of the um, whole spring quarter. The only thing that's not up there is May 20th, which um, should be updated shortly. But Courtney Meehan, who was supposed to come and talk in winter quarter and had to cancel for um, a family emergency, is luckily now able to come and join us on May 20th. And I think also there's going to be one extra Beck talk. Um, but I so we'll put information up on that um, very, very soon. OK. Um, there's a sign-up sheet going around, so if you haven't already signed it, please do. That helps us keep track of how many people are here and where they're coming from across campus and things like that. Um, before I introduce today's speaker, I'll just give you a brief preview of the next couple of weeks. Um, so next week, April 8th, Alexandra Binder, um, who's here at UCLA, is going to be talking. The title of her talk is Epigenetics and the Developmental Origins of Health and Disease. So it should be actually a very nice follow-up to this week's talk. The following week, um, Pam Yang, um, uh, faculty also here at UCLA, uh, is giving a talk called How Interactions Among Multiple Stressors Affect the Ecological and Evolutionary Trajectories of Populations. So look forward to those. And this week, I'm very happy to introduce Ashley Hazel, who's coming to us from Stanford. Um, and her talk is entitled, Ecological Dynamics of Sexually Transmitted Infections Among Human Beings. Okay. Welcome. Thanks, Brooke. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk today about the work I've been doing in uh, Calcaveld, Namibia. And um, I'm going to talk to you about the, my work in the ecology of sexually transmitted infections, or trying to put an ecological framework on to studying sexually transmitted infections. So I work in a place that I imagine a lot of you are familiar with because of Brooke's work. I work in, uh, in Namibia, in Kalkaveld, which is in this very arid part of a generally quite arid country. Um, Kalkaveld is in the northwest. Um, and I work in, um, I have worked around a range of villages sort of north and west of Apuo, sort of south of the Kunene River um, at the Angolan border. Um, so I don't need to say too much about this area because I think, like I said, I think you guys are pretty familiar with it. But um, the, this is an area that's pri primarily dominated by the um, pastoralist um, economic cultural system. So although there's a lot of subsistence practices in addition to pastoralism, there is um, people keep maize gardens. Um, people do a range of types of foraging, usually um, opportunistic, um, occasionally out of necessity. But everyone, regardless of how much livestock they actually own or their family owns, are, are really tied economically and culturally to this pastoralist system. Um, Kalkaveld is not a very large uh, geographic area, but it's, it's pretty diverse, both spatially and temporally. So um, you, know, you can be in uh, some areas that are, are just kind of altogether quite dry. It's a hard place to um, grow very much maize or even find much grazing for your livestock at any time of year. And then there are some villages that, in a good rain season, actually get ephemeral rivers. And so you get a, a you know you don't have to travel nearly as far for cattle posts and you can you can grow a much larger um, garden yield. So it's a lot of variation, um, not just sort of between villages, but but also over time. So um, even a nice place like this becomes quite dry uh, toward the end of the year, as further you get from the rainy season. Um, a really important feature, of course, uh, behaviorally about and why I study STDs here is that. Um, there's partner concurrency is a really common um, practice by everyone. So men and women have multiple partners, uh, not just while they're married, but before they're married. It's generally culturally normative, and um, there are not strict vigilance. You know, there isn't strict vigilance, uh, particularly against women. Um, and so, in this context of a pastoralist context, where people are moving around a lot, they're often sort of making last-minute decisions to leave their home villages. They may be traveling far to find um, grazing for their herds. They may be away for long periods of time, particularly during particularly stressful dry seasons. Um, it, it makes sense to think about um, multiple partner concurrency as an ecological strategy, right? When you are far from your, your immediate family, you're either because you're traveling or your people in your family are traveling, um, the sexual relationships that you build can sort of you know, basically connect those bridges that you lose during times when you're far from people. So um, it's a, it seems to be a really valuable ecological strategy 
but um, like most things in life, uh, it comes with a trade-off, right? Which is that you get really high STI exposure. So should we let that person in? <laughs> I think someone's trying to get in. Um, so I've been studying um, herpes and gonorrhea, uh, two very different pathogens for several years. Um, so, and they're very different types of pathogens. So herpes, um, and they're both really highly prevalent. Herpes, um, I found about a 35% prevalence, which I actually think was kind of low. I think that the, um, that we had a lot of false, just because the sort of tests we used, sort of after where we used a rapid test um, when we did these studies, um, later on was found to have some um, uh, high, high rates of false negatives in um, some African populations where they kind of test them. So I think actually it's a little higher than that. But in general, you get really high rates of, of, of herpes, which increases with age, which is what you'd expect from a virus that has life you have for your whole life. You can um, intermittently shed um, throughout your entire life. And you don't, uh, they're, you know, it's not curable. And in this context, you certainly don't have access to antivirals. So it's not unusual that it increases with age. It's also not unusual that you see much higher prevalence in women than men. That's also a common feature of herpes. Um, the, the distance in women's prevalence and men's prevalence may be particular to this community because of the practice of dry sex which increases risk of um, transmission for women. Um, and the fact that men are circumcised, which would decrease risk for men. So that might exacerbate that difference. Um, with gonorrhea, which is a, a self-limiting bacteria, um, we see an opposite effect, right? It decreases with age. Found an overall prevalence of 64%. I'm going to talk more about gonorrhea later. But what I want to point out at this slide is that you have two diseases, two um, infections that are very highly prevalent um, and have, um, because of the sort of the, the biology of those pathogens, they, they distribute um, demographically really differently. They also interact with environmental um, forces very differently too. So what I want to talk about are the ways in which we see um, people's subsistence behavior and changes over, over the seasons, over the year, um, and how that interacts with disease risk and exposure for these two different pathogens. Um, and so basically just to kind of frame the way I think about things, because um, I sort of come from this kind of weird interdisciplinary background. Um, I, I, I'm really interested in that relationship between human environmental interactions and how that uh, affects your exposure to infectious disease and even the selective pressures on local pathogens. And I kind of come at this from this, this kind of interdisciplinary framework where I use a behavioral ecology theoretical point of view to apply to common epidemiologic problems and public health problems. And I'm, I'm interested in thinking about STDs as a disease ecologist. And you know, STDs, um, because they're, they don't typically involve the environment in terms of their direct transmission pathways, are usually neglected by disease ecologists. And I think that um, I'm going to try to make a case for why we should, we should, we should really bring them into that um, conversation. Um, so when I work out in Namibia, we um, kind of work from this sort of mobile lab. This is what it, our research station looks like. There's no infrastructure, as you can see. There's nowhere to store our samples at a really finely um, monitored temperature. So our, our methods for collecting these data have to be mindful of that, our, our um, disease uh, status data. Um, and I'm going to talk about work I've been doing over a few different sort of years of data collection. And um, my sort of largest, earliest data set was um, combines um, data collection from about 28 villages across Calcavelle. So they're sort of across some of these um, areas with different types of, you know, sort of variable ecologies. But um, in later years, I've been focusing on some villages kind of further out here um, in the West. And so um, I'm starting to take a more longitudinal focused approach. So just to give you a sense of the scope of where my data come from. Um, and like I said, we don't have these kind of, we don't have a real f lab in the field. So um, for the herpes data that I uh, ha am going to show, we use rapid tests, which um, Give us a uh, which which show us anti antibody to HS herpes simplex virus two, which is the strain of herpes that's most commonly associated with genital transmission. So it's the it's the STD of the herpes family. Um, and then uh, 
for gonorrhea, we had um, participants um, self-collect genital swabs, which we roll onto this um, Wattman card, which um, is really just like a simple kind of folded index card. But um, there's a chemical matrix which, allow, which basically lyses the cells kills proteins and holds DNA stable. It actually holds DNA stable for many years. Um, so it's used in a lot of different research now in these kind of low tech contexts. Um, it's limited in what you can get from it. Um, can't do a lot, we can't do any whole genome sequencing. We, don't, we can't really amplify up from it very well. We have no bugs from the field, we just have DNA. Um, and you can imagine that because this is um, carded directly from a human sample, there's a lot of human DNA, lots of other kinds of um, microbes in there. So, you know, it's not the most sensitive system, but it is good enough to go back and do qPCR. So we can look at, um, we can identify gonorrhea um, DNA, and we can look at quantities. We can look at um, amount in a, in a sample, which can tell us something about that that individual person's infection. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about herpes for a little bit. So the the chart I showed you before of herpes prevalence was by um, age and sex. Um, and those, those distributions, like I said, were kind of like what you see of herpes, you know, high prevalence herpes populations anywhere. But one thing that came up for me was um, that I also found a significant variation by region. So um, in these 28 villages where I worked, I'm going to just point my, my own hands here. Um, in the, in the um, regions where I worked, um, so I, these little circles represent all the, the villages where I collected data. And then um, there are these locally recognized traditional regions that kind of cluster villages together um, that are just geographically proximate, but also kind of reflect some sort of horse historical connection, familial connection. So people that you know, live in a village in a certain region, their cattle posts are likely to be from there, and their family is from that area. So it's, it's sort of clustering, a way of sort of clustering out um, villages. And because you know, the, the sample size per village varied so much where we collected data, where we had data from, um, the region was like a good aggregate from, to, to compare, um, do any kind of geographic comparisons. And so what I found was that um, these three regions called the Marian Flus, Odosemo, and Omunyandu, which are reflected in the same colors here, had significantly higher prevalence than Omanda, Ehama, and sort of just a cluster of people that are coming from some of these outer regions where we hadn't collected data, but we picked up in our sample as they were traveling through. Um, and when I, and it actually, when I first was doing this work, my, my original hypothesis was that um, herpes prevalence would be higher if you in villages or regions closer to some of these cities. So these little towns, you have Apuo, which is the actual capital of Kunene, and then um, Itanga, um, um, Okungwati, and Apupa, which are these like, kind of pass through sort of little small cities. Um, and I thought that if you're closer to the cities, you might have more opportunities for partner exchange, um, anonymous sexual partners, and so you might see a higher prevalence. Totally wasn't true. There was no relationship between like any kind of direct Euclidean distance and, um, and prevalence. But qualitatively, I looked at this map a little bit closer, and I was like, well, OK, so Marian Flus, I just know it's just really, really far from everything. It takes, it takes a full day to get out there. Um, people from this area don't seem to really get out to any other areas. Um, although Samo is not really that far, and it's kind of close to a, a pupa, but there's a road that runs through here, and people that live over here don't really seem to connect much to people over here. Um, they may connect to people down and, you know, sort of across the zebra, before the zebra mountains. But even the zebra mountains, um, which are this sort of land feature right here, um, seem to block a lot of connectivity over here. And then I thought, I, maybe that's the same with, with, with this region called Omunyandu. I couldn't really say from my personal experience, um, but I, there is a mountain pass through there, which I know would make it difficult to move from Omunyandu to the other areas. So I thought, maybe there's something about sort of like a functional remoteness, so like the, literally the opposite of what I was thinking that might, that might be important. And so maybe if you're actually really remote, you might be in these smaller communities and smaller networks of partners where you could get rapid transmission, right? Because if you have a smaller pool of people, every time you kind of go and pick a new partner or you meet your old partner, there's a lower chance that that person's going to have not had been exposed to herpes virus, right? So you're, you're going to get it. You could see accelerated transmission in a community like that. So um, 
I decided to sort of think more about my data, what, I, what, what data I had, and whether or not I could really test that. And so I thought, if that's true, if, if, if a sort of functional remoteness actually increases your exposure and your, the prevalence of a viral, um, a viral um, pathogen, then first of all, the people in those high prevalence regions um, should be more likely to be selecting partners from their own region, which we call partner homophily, right? So if, if it's true that that kind of walls you off from other partners, then that means you're mostly taking your partners from that area. Um, likewise, we have to find some way of, of showing that, that that's not just because people are choosing partners, like just because maybe there's some sort of local preference for just taking someone close by, but that you're actually constrained by your geography. And so um, in the surveys, my surveys of um, people I interviewed, I, I always ask people about their travel. So where, name the three to five places you go most often, why do you go, how do you get there, stuff like that. Um, which is in its way its own kind of network um, uh, data because you're, you're connecting people to places, which is sort of like a kind of bimodal type of network data. And then, of course, I, I forgot to mention that I also um, ask people detailed questions about their sexual relationships. So because partner concurrency is, is fairly normative, people aren't too shy to talk about it. So you can get some pretty decent network data. And people know a lot about everyone, that they're, 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 they're sexual partners and their partner's partners, because it's a pretty small community. So you can get really detailed um, partner information. So we ask about who your partners are, where your partners are from. And so we know your partner's regions. So, um, so these were kind of the two hypotheses going into um, that I, I, I had to sort of say whether or not functional remoteness would really be a driver for um, herpes, the, the distribution of herpes prevalence. And um, what I did was I took those, um, don't worry too much about the reading the tables, but what I wanted to show you is I had these two matrices of mixing. These are sort of mixing matrices. Um, and so this is the regions that people are from and the regions that their partners are from. And so, of course, the diagonal is where you'd find the homophily, right? where you're picking the partners that you are, um, that are from your same region. And then same idea here, the regions that people are from and the regions that they, they travel to, so the counts on where they travel. And of course, the, the, the diagonal is when you're traveling within your region. So other villages within your region, right? Um, and so I, I applied these, these mixing matrices to um, uh, sets of log linear models. And a log linear model is essentially a Poisson model of count data, so where we can actually embed in a, ma a matrix in it. So instead of just looking at, say, like your average contact rates for regions, or even just sort of like just looking at um, average homophily um, across regions, we can look at the differential homophily as well. So not just how how much are some regions mixing with themselves versus other regions, but how much are they mixing with the other regions? So we can actually get a sense of how you know, how your, um, how your connectivity, either to partners or the places you travel, compares in the diversity of, of, your, of your mixing relative to um, people in other areas. And so, first of all, I found that there was a very significant effect of partner homophily. So people from the Marian Flus, Odo Semo, and Omonyandu were much more significantly likely to pick partners from their own regions. So the heat map, and you can sort of see on the diagonal, the, you know, and, and, and homophily is common anyway. It's just you're going to pick partners that are closer to where you live. It's, it's just, it's easier to get to know people and see them more often, right? But um, so there's a you know, strong yellow across the diagonal, but we can definitely see um, some pretty strong yellow with the, you know, brighter between these sort of, these uh, highly, the, the regions with the higher prevalence. Um, in these two, the, the last two columns and rows, the other in cities, there's a lot more of that kind of mottled yellow there. The, kind of the pattern kind of breaks down, but that's because I have really small sample sizes for that. Those are people we were catching as they were passing through and they were coming from regions we weren't working in. So, and just by virtue of the fact that we're catching them out of their region, they might be outliers anyway. So I didn't want to take them out of the, the sample because I didn't want to miss, miss people's connections to people outside. But, um, but yeah, so the, it, it's a little bit of a small sample here. But within the main regions, you can see that um, the effect seemed to hold. Um, the same was true when we looked at um, your, your mobility and where you're traveling to. So um, not quite as strong, but still significant. And again, there's a lot more 
a lot more variation coming from these outer regions where people, where we had the smaller sample sizes. But again, we caught them outside of their villages. So they might be the really, the really mobile people. But we can see these like white hot cells for the Marian sluice, Odosemo, and Omanyandu. Um, so that connection seems to hold true, um, that people in those regions are more likely to take partners locally, and they're likely to do that probably because of these geographic constraints. And again, the reason that really matters is because in these small communities um, where you have um, small networks that are tightly con clustered, uh, tightly connected rather, because of um, co partner concurrency, it doesn't take very much partner concurrency. Um, we're not talking, you know, really kind of huge amounts of partner exchange, and it just takes very small amounts of partner concurrency to. Um, create extremely connected networks. So this is a, just um, an example from a great model, um, model study from Carnegie and Morris where they, they took just sort of a theoretical network where in this case you have obviously these, these separated networks where you have about 50% partner concurrency, just two or three partners. And when you up it by 4% um, till you get to 68%, you get total connectivity, right? I mean, this is, this, this is a theoretical model, but you can just imagine what disease transmission could look like through something like that. And so I wanted to then um, consider whether or not the conditions that um, the, 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 the network data and the travel data that, that I have for Calcavelt, if, if we can sort of look at that also in a modeling context, can we kind of create some, can we, can we sort of see this sort of similar phenomenon from actual network data? So what I did was, I took my network data from so my 2009 data set where I have about 445 people and their partners. Um, and uh, and I, it's actually a fairly connected graph, but what I did was with, with some sort of unconnected bits kind of around. Um, but what I did was I took it and I artificially broke it apart so that I had um, five different unconnected regions as if they had no contact with each other. But you can see, and so they're colored by the regions which match the colors I was showing in the map earlier. Um, with some mixing, so I was trying to maintain in the network the actual, um, the actual amount of like, differential homophily that existed in these areas. So I just, I just cut the bridges that sort of connected where there were some connections between them. Um, and then um, I, at random, added 3% more ties to the network. And by doing that, I got this. And then I added 3% um, more, maybe 2% more to get 5% from the original, and I got this. So we see this same sort of, it takes very little additional um, connectivity to build from, um, to build up to a totally connected network, right? And then if you run, a, if you run an infection through that, so I ran a really simple, um, what we call an SI model, which is you go from susceptible to infected, and then presumably you stay infected forever, which is what would be the case with herpes. Um, herpes is actually very complex to model because there's a lot of um, immune factors you have to consider, um, whether or not someone is infected with other um, strains of herpes, like herpes one, which is the oral herpes, which most people have. Um, and I don't have those data. So, so I wasn't really interested in the endpoints, the sort of equilibrium points and like kind of disease, the final sort of disease prevalence in this modeling exercise. I just wanted to see how much more efficiently does it spread between these different um, versions of the of the network data, and you can see that you know you can start out with these, um, and I'm sorry, and these are the endpoints. So this was running it after about um, 180 time steps, which is like half a year, right? And after that many time steps, I'm sorry, 250, so about two months. I mean, two seasons. Um, it still stays pretty much in one area, right? It doesn't get out. It doesn't get out across too many bridges. But with these ties, you can start to get really rapid spreading. And then this is just another way of looking at the same data. So the susceptibles, um, if I let this run, it wouldn't take long until eventually it, the, all models would run to 100% infectivity because there's no, there's no decrease in them. There's, no way, there's nothing in the model that would turn off infection. Everyone's just going to slowly get there. Um, but what's interesting is where, how quickly you start to see um, infectivity rise, right? And so um, in this third model, by the time we get to um, 250 days, there's already um, over 50% um, infectiousness. Um, and I think that what's important here is, is that, you know, again, the remoteness gives this structure in a network of acceleration. You get these tiny pools where you can get rapid acceleration, which is, um, 
with something like herpes, I mean, it's herpes is not the worst thing in the world, um, but there are a lot of other infections that can spread in this manner that would be really important and to think about and are dangerous, right? And that can matter in a context of also changing mobility because with the with the existence of these pockets, these small kind of connect, connected pockets, and then bridging, you get um, structures that look like what brought HIV through um, Eastern Africa a generation ago, right? You have um, these kind of chains where you can get importation across large geographic areas, um, which were basically these trucking routes when truckers were um, having sex with local sex workers. But those local sex workers were connected to small rural communities where they might have had a husband or a boyfriend or maybe a couple boyfriends in a normative way, right, in a normative concurrency way. Um, and then so you get this like very local rapid acceleration that then can increase the importation across these larger barriers. So, you know, we want to worry about some, some structures like that building in, in Kalkaveld. And, you know, there's evidence that there's changing mobility, right? So we talked about how, so, you know, there are these areas that are connected to these small towns and cities. And those towns are getting bigger. Um, they're becoming inhabited by people from lots of different areas. There's a lot of people passing through just researchers like me, but tourists, government workers, NGO workers, um, people from other parts of Namibia. And so, um, and people from these rural areas, rural parts of village, villages in Kalkaveld are, are have more ac ac access to those areas. There's more trucks going through, locally owned trucks. Um, there's more access to cash, so hitchhiking is easier. So we can imagine the more bridges building, even while some of these rural structures remain in place. And just to sort of think about this from a bigger context. So, you know, Namibia, this blue map, you know, Namibia is the dark, um, you know, the dark color countries here. Namibia is one of the countries that was burdened um, with really high, a, a big HIV crisis. And even though Namibia is pretty good at um, accessing, accessing people to treatment and testing in areas where it's been really high, um, and so you still have high prevalence, even if, you know, you don't have high rates of new infection anymore. But when we look by, re by um, districts of Namibia, um, Kalkaveld is, has some of the lowest prevalences in the country, but it's adjacent to some of the highest, right? And then look at the map by population density. Namibia won't impress anyone with this population density anywhere, but um, where is it really highly dense? Um, right here on the border, right? In these areas that have high prevalence, um, high HIV prevalence. And we're, we're starting to see a lot of movement from that area. Um, people who are um, starting to move to Kalkaveld either permanently or spending some time there as traders and um, bringing goods into the villages. So we're starting to see some novel movement or at least increases in movement that were, that were um, rare in the past. So I think that um, the changes in the network structures um, alongside some of these kind of older rural structures is gonna be a really important public health problem. Um, but I think we also want to think about that in the change in change in, in, in climate and ecology. So um, Namibia has just been through a really severe drought. Um, I think, did you notice less cows? Yeah, it's a shock. It, it's, it's, and um, I think they've had a couple of, in the last couple of years, been a couple of years with some better rain. But, um, you know, people, I've got data from 2015 and 2016 where I think nobody told me that they grew maize that year. Um, and you know, you just see a lot of, a lot of um, abandoned wells and people having to go further and longer to, to um, care for their cattle. Um, and also just the climate models looking over the next um, several decades to show increasing dryness. Um, it's gonna get drier and drier. And so people are going to have to adapt to this and to this, um, these changes. And how people, the decisions people make um, about how they're going to live in this newly aired environment where pastoralism just can't be sub sustained, um, we don't really know. I mean, I, I can imagine a, a, a mix of things, but um, that's going to have an impact on the disease dynamics and the, and the changes in, in um, not just how diseases transmit, but I think the selective pressure is operating, operating on those. And so for that, I want to talk, I want to take a sip of water, and then I want to talk about gonorrhea. Because gonorrhea actually um, is a really fascinating pathogen, um, because partly because it's it it mutates very fast, right? So it's a it's a bacteria that, like all bacteria, in one way or another, can take up um, genetic information from other pa other microbes and pathogens, right? Um, but gonorrhea is really fascinating because it can take it up in like 
every known way at all times of its life course. So it's super, super competent. Um, so that means it's really fast at evolving um, in, um, microbial resistance, antimicrobial resistance. Um, and it's, it's one of the, the kind of growing superbugs in the world, right? So I don't know anything about antibiotic resistance in this community. Um, people don't get treated very often, so it's probably not a big problem now. But just knowing, thinking about this pathogen as one that's very, very responsive to its two selective pressures um, means that it's something that we expect that the, the dynamics of gonorrhea um, burden and gonorrhea, gonorrhea epidemiology to change um, rather rapidly as people's subsistence changes, as their behavior changes. And as subsistence changes, sexual behavior is probably likely to change. If not the norms and values, then certainly your access to partners. And I'm going to try to make a case for that now. So I want to talk a little bit more about um, how what I know about gonorrhea um, epidemiology in this area. So, so first of all, um, it looks really different from what we know about it from most of the literature, because most, most of the time gonorrhea is studied in a, some kind of clinic-based setting. Um, and that usually means from people that are coming in maybe because they're symptomatic, so they know they have an infection, um, or maybe because you're, you're sort of screening a high-risk kind of subset of a community anyway. And so, and so there's access, there's sort of a presumed access to treatment already. Um, and so what I found um, in my research here is that, so first of all, it's super, super prevalent. 64% of the people that I surveyed who got, I got genital samples from had gonorrhea DNA in their, in their sample. That's crazy high. Um, now, of, the, of all the gonorrhea um, positive samples, 16% are what I'm calling high titer. So there's this cutoff of about, I don't know, um, I think it was like 1,000 copies per sample, um, which is about the sort of, um, it's about the, 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 the ID50 dose, um, sort of an old microbial tech, um, jargon. But basically, I interpret those, these sort of high titer infections to probably be these kind of like newer infections, more recently acquired. Um, and then all the others, so about 48% um, of people um, were, had these low titer infections. And um, just sort of looking at the demographics of that, you'll see that it sort of decreases with age. Um, overall, um, but the difference between men and women is, isn't quite as high. Women had slightly higher prevalence, but I don't think it was significantly higher. Um, but the, the, the high titer infections, which are these really the bold colored bars, so blue for men, red for women, and the, the bolder color are the high titer. And I don't think the, the light blue is showing up very well, but where these sort of numbers are, there's actually a light blue bar. And so the, the paler bars, the light blue and the pink, are um, the low titer infections, the, pers the, the percentage of low titer infections. So there was a significant drop in the high titer infections with age. And I think that has something to do with immunity, right? So we know that there's some immunity to gonorrhea. It tends to be strain specific and it, it's sort of facultative so it can kind of wane after time. It's not permanent. So you can get infected many times with the strain, same strain. But what this, this picture sort of says is that there may be some kind of patchwork immunity that builds up. So when you're young and you're in your early 20s, you're getting exposed to strains, new strains for the first time, you're more likely to get these big infections. And then over time, um, you don't get big infections anymore. You're more likely to get these kind of lower, tighter infections. I can say, too, that until you get older, so in most of these age, in these age categories, and not until like sort of the older, the much older people in this oldest age category, we don't really see a drop off in partner numbers. Um, I'm not sure, because at this time I wasn't collecting data on your number of times you were having sex, so maybe your, your actual activity is dropping, but people weren't reporting significantly lower partner numbers as they got older, so it's not about just less exposure because of less sex. Um, so, so part of this picture is that there's probably this kind of immunity that builds up, which is probably more significant in a place like this because people really aren't getting treated. Um, and so you, it, that means that your infection is lasting longer. It's giving your immune system a longer time to sort of respond to it. Um, I think the other thing going on here, too, is that these low titer infections are untreated infections. And they're, they may have, some of them may have started out as these sort of big infections that are just waning because they're not getting treated. And the reason people aren't getting treated primarily is because most people, I mean, like 95% of women, so like practically all women, and most men report no symptoms don't really know what that's about. That could be biological, something about the strains. Um, it could be something about you know, the fact that um, people are maybe not getting symptoms after ex being exposed to a, um, particular strains over and over again. 
It could also just be something about your expectations of what is a symptom, what's normative. If you get infected a lot, um, if you get familiar or used to some level of dis discomfort, um, then what does it mean to be symptomatic anymore? So there, all these pieces could be there. We don't quite know yet, but that's something we're going to we're sort of starting to get some capacity to work on. But um, but asymptomicity is a really important pick part of this picture. It seems to be really driving um, driving uh, these kind of low level infections that persist for a long period of time. So long infection duration, and which means you know more likely to get exposed. Um, but also, like I said, you know, we have, we have partner concurrency, which is um, probably connected to high subsistence mobility. So you get very strongly connected networks. Um, and you know, from two, two years of data, my 2009 data set, which is much larger, and I've got um, 2015 to 2016. I don't know why I didn't put 2015 here. But, um, but the point here was that um, about fifth, almost 50% of people have more than one partner within a six month period. I don't know what the two, I'm assuming the 2015 will look the same. I just didn't put it for some reason. So we know that gonorrhea is partly driven by this high connectivity. So you're going to get a lot of opportunities to be exposed. It's driven by the asymptomicity, which increases duration of infection. There's also a seasonal component here too. So these dark green bars are the um, high, high titer infections which I mostly found among people that I interviewed during the winter months, which are the June and July months. Brooke and I were just talking about when exactly we think that is. And, but that's this time, sort of late rainy, post rainy season. You're, you have a bit of relief from the, the major subsistence work. And um, that's a good time to start having ceremonies, right? Uh, weddings, ancestor ceremonies. Um, there's aggregation. There's um, low cal you don't have as much calorie stress. It's a good time to meet people, right? So it's not a surprise that we might see really high, higher numbers of these like newer infections, sort of more recently acquired infections. And those, that number starts to um, peter off as we get further into the year and further into the dry months. But the low titer infections don't significantly drop. They kind of maintain, they, they persist, which is probably a mix of these infections not going away, sort of persisting over these dry years, but maybe also acquisition of newer low level infections because you're maybe getting infected by um, uh, someone who ha was infected at a low level. I'm not really sure if um, that's how that would work. If you get infected with someone that has a small infection, if you, that would also not mean you get a large infection. There's probably an immune component. But, but we definitely see this kind of dry season effect. Um, and yeah, like I said, you get these, you get these ancestor ceremonies. Where everyone gets together. Um, it's a really important social mo a moment of social cohesion um, after many months of working very hard. And you party a little bit, right? Um, it's it's a, a really valuable time socially, but um, it, comes at a, it comes at a health risk. And so all this kind of draws a picture to me of this sort of sort of like dynamic endemicity, right? And so with gonorrhea, I think what, what, what happens is that, you know, during these, these dry seasons, you get this drop of an exposure. Um, and so you're probably having, you know, I, I expect transmission to drop, the, you know, transmission rates to drop. Um, but it can't go away altogether because this is still a pretty closed sexual network. So it's not getting re-imported every year. So it's got to be maintained at some perceptible level, but probably lower. Um, it also looks to me from my more recent data um, that sexual activity decreases in those dry seasons. So in 2015 and 2016, um, when I started recollecting network data, in addition to asking like, who are your partners and you know, where do they live and who are your partner's partners, I also started asking people to tell me this information on a timeline. So when are you actually meeting these, your partners? And when you meet, um, are you having sex? How often? So we're actually getting sort of a timeline of, of sort of temporal network data. And what it sounds like is that people are meeting um, their, so they'll, they'll, they'll start out by saying, well, I have X number of partners. But then when we go down and put that on the timeline, they're often not meeting those partners um, or they're meeting them really, really infrequently. And qualitatively, people will say, when I say, well, why didn't you see this person? Well, like, well, I was at the cattle post. I was there all, all dry season. You know, I, I never got away. I never, we never met. Um, and so the other thing that seems I think very important for the perspective of, tra of disease transmission is that we would see this um, temporal clustering of sex acts. So when people are meeting their partners, particularly people, well, actually, there's two things going on. Um, for certain kinds of relationships, it looks like people tend to um, cluster their um, having sex into these short time periods. 
Um, and by clustering, I mean like you're either having sex more than once a day with the same person or um, several days in a row. So like two or three days in a row, you know, you, you, you have sex every night. And that's happening, it happens most, I would say in 40% of these relationships, it was happening with polygynous spouses and also with your partner that you weren't married to, particularly if your partner wasn't married. And I think that's two kind of separate things. So with the polygynous spouses, it's, it's often that people are reporting that um, the husband is moving between his spouses, and so this is their norm. And so when they have sex, they have sex several times, then he goes to the next wife. And of course, they don't have sex every time. There may be some breaks, or there may be far. But when they're together, this is what they do. And um, with extramarital partners, it seems to be more of an opportunistic thing. You know, we're here, we're together, um, our spouses aren't around, we have an opportunity, and we may not see each other for another couple months or who knows when. So you have you have lots of sex in that short time period. Um, I think. You know, it's, it's weird to ask people about these kinds of things. But I, I think it's important, has a really important impact on transmission. Because, um, you know, sex is a, you know, you, you, you have a local tissue injury during sex, right? There's going to be micro abrasions, uh, mi abrasions micro tears, the sort of um, inflammation, upregulation of immune activity, all of which increases your exposure, your likelihood of getting infected if you're having sex with an infected person, right? So. So I think of this sort of clustering behavior as a thing where with each additional um, time you have sex with your partner in that tiny window, you're increasing your transmission probability just probably a little bit, right? And while that may not be important, say, in a winter month when there's just a lot more opportunity to have sex and there are a lot more high titer infections, which I think are highly transmissible anyway, um, so I, I think that effect might wash out. But in these... Um, these, this dry season where um, you have less opportunity to meet your partners, where the gonorrhea that's circulate, circulating is kind of lower, tighter anyway, and so it's probably less transmissible, um, this might have an important effect. So I wanted to uh, try to model that. And the um, model approach that I decided to take, I, tried to, I wanted to do a compartmental model because this is kind of the classic way of studying gonorrhea. I don't know that it's still the best way, but this gonorrhea is this kind of canonical, um, what we call an SIS model. So when you, when a model that allows um, people to move from being susceptible to infected to back to susceptible, um, and sort of do this through a system of differential equations. And the, the probability of going from susceptible to infected is through some product of a contact rate and a transmission rate. Um, and again, like I said before, because we don't know a lot about um, asymptomatic infections and how they, we, we know that they're important, but we don't really, there isn't really good data about um, how they, um, how asymptomatic infections really drive um, local um, gonorrhea epidemics. And we really know nothing about under, untreated or undertreated populations. So we rely a lot on, on this compartmental models to sort of make guesses at what are some of the transmission parameters or dynamics that really matter. And a lot of that, because a lot of people that do this work, they're really good at models, but they don't necessarily go out and do field work. And so the contact parameters are really simplistic, right? And a lot of them rely on this idea that there's a few people that are like super, super active and constantly changing partners, and they just have a little bit of contact with a majority of the population that's totally monogamous, which is not true for like anyone, right? But certainly not in a lot of these um, subsistence populations where concurrency is normative and, and supportive of a deeper social fabric. Um, so my current network data are, um, like I said, I'm sort of doing it on this, I think I sort of said this, I won't go too long here, but like I said, we're, um, we're asking people about who their partners are, their partner's partners, we're getting a lot of information about those partners, and we're putting it on a timeline. So when are you actually meeting, and how frequently are you able to have sex with, with that person when you meet? And so that allows us to really create deeper um, contact rates in our, in our model. So um, just to tell you a little bit about what, um, what we're putting in. So the contact rate, which is sort of typically it's modeled as like basically a partner exchange rate, which is nothing but actually how often you're having sex. But because um, we know when people, how frequently people are meeting their partners, we have an actual contact rate per partnership. So how on average, how often are you having sex? Um, but then um, we also have really good data for a mixing parameter. So people aren't just mixing at random. That's not true anywhere, right? You're, there's, some, there's some selectivity in who you're meeting. And so, um, you know, in this case, I think what I've been looking at was how your marriage status affects your um, uh, 
your likelihood of picking someone of another marriage status. So I've got this matrix of mixing parameters of, you know, a man and woman's marriage status. So whether you're polygynously married, whether you're married but not polygynously, or whether you're not married, across whether or not your your sexual partner, your um, rate of so the sort of the rate of time of, of partnerships that you make, your rate of selecting a partner who is a polygynous spouse, a non-polygynous spouse, so your, your own spouse, versus someone who's polygynously married but not your spouse, non-polygynously married but not your spouse, so the EMP is extramarital partner, or your non-married extramarital partner. So um, we've got really good mixing data, which is really important for creating that structure of um, how people are connecting. And then lastly, um, I've got you know this transmission parameter, which is always for an STD. Um, there's always um, a uh, sub the um, subscript for your the, the sexual direction. So is it male male to female or female to male? Because it's always higher male to female. But we've added another subscript for um, for clustering. And so for those relationships where we saw higher amounts of clustering, which is when you're having sex with your polygynously married spouse or when you're having sex with your non-married partner. Um, basically added in a cluster effect where those, those relationships were higher risk because they were associated with more clustering. And um, what we found was uh, that basically in both cases, transmission goes down. If you start with a kind of um, initial condition of about 50% prevalence, which is actually low <laughs> relative to the population, um, and we sort of mimic these conditions of these kind of low activity, low tighter seasons, um, we see a drop in transmission in both cases. But where, we, where I ran the model without the cluster effect, just the straight transmission parameter, it kind of just drops altogether. And it gets down. And I'm not interested in the equilibrium here again. I'm interested in these sort of first couple hundred days that might mimic like a dry season. So what's happening with the gonorrhea in this sort of dry season? Because after a couple hundred days I, or less, I expect dynamics to change because mobility and, and contact structures change. But we see this sort of overall drop um, that would go very quickly, and, um, and there's really no effect on the kind of partnerships you're having. But when we add in the cluster effect, we can see this sort of structuring by partnership, and it's held up longer. So um, we can sort of maintain, even like among some of the higher level, um, the higher risk groups, like the polygynously married um, groups, higher prevalence. Um, and so which could maintain that into that, into that season where um, it ticks back up again. You know, this is based on very limited data. Um, you know, my sample sets, my sort of newer data sets where I have these sort of count data or, or sexual contact data are small. And so they're, they're, they're affected by biases. And I had a couple of people, a couple of women, um, monogamously married women that claimed incredibly high rates of contact. That could be true. But I think it may have driven some odd dynamics here that I'm not sure I believe yet. But you know, we can keep working on it and, um, and hopefully sort of build these models out. And I think another thing, too, with, with more data, I think, you know, this is sort of, I'm basically kind of faking a time component in here by putting the clustering in the transmission model. But really, it would be nice to have an actual time component where I can split up the, are you clustering because this is your polygynous spouse and, you know, it's part of the fairness of a, a man sharing his time with his wives? Or are you clustering opportunistically because you don't know when you're just going to see this person again. And those should have very different effects, too. And I can't really account for that at this point. So that's something that um, we're going to work on going forward. I have about five minutes. Should I kind of wrap up with questions? or? OK, I have like a one other result, um, which is also a result in progress, another modeling result that we're, use, we're um, doing from these, um, now that we have these, like, you know, when are you actually meeting and, and, and like the temporal sexual network data. So. Um, these are three graphs of my networks from three different years. This is 2009. We have a much larger sample across many, many um, villages and across three seasons. I had data from all three seasons. So it's not exactly comparable with my 2015, 2016 data, which are from the same cluster of villages um, and are obviously much smaller sample sizes. But one thing that um, I can just very qualitatively see is that you know these two um, sets of data were collected during um, dry season. This was the actual dry season after kind of a decent rain. Um, and this was a, a severe drought year. Um, in both cases, we see um, lower degree, which is just number of partners, the number of contacts, um, significantly lower, well, too small to say significantly, but, but much lower than my larger season. And then also, it was especially low in the drought season. 
and these are enlarged. These these um, the nodes are enlarged by your 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 degree. And you can just see, you know, qualitatively, a lot more of these larger, you know, people with more contacts. It's a little soupier here, um, just qualitatively. Um, so it does appear that there is some kind of, you know, you know, in addition to people telling us that you know we don't see our partners very much, we see lower counts, we can sort of see that in the kind of aggregate of the networks as well. And so one thing we've been working on are these sort of other forms of um, network models, which in the family of exponential random graph models, which are essentially a way of doing statistical, statistical models, right? It's a way of running a type of logistic model to look at what are the, what are the probabilities, what are, what are the characteristics that, that make a probability of a tie between any individuals or nodes in a network. Um, but unlike a logi logistic model, we can um, do this on a network where we cl completely violate the assumption of independence. Because of course, these data are independent. They're, they're networks. They're relational data. Um, but within that family of, of ergoms, there are tergoms, which are tem temporal ergoms, where um, we can actually look not just at ties, but dissolution and formation of ties. So what would predict dissolution and formation over time? So this is a, um, a uh, dynamic model. And, and we're working on these um, dynamic re network regression models that um, are, were developed by um, Zach Almquist. And um, we're working together to fit my data, my sort of growing small data. And, and this is a nice um, new class of model because um, it can be applied to the kind of data I'm having, sort of these, that I'm collecting these sort of panel data that are heavily sampled, right? We don't have complete networks. And it's hard to get good um, longitudinal data in a, in a really tight way because People are mobile. Every time we go back, we don't know who we're going to see. We're getting some, some longitudinality. But in, in each season, we can look at um, time in terms of dissolution, who, who you're seeing over that, that period in the last six months. right? So we can look at dissolution formation in that last little window. And so these are really small um, results. But sort of this is looking back over, you know, we, we ask people who you've seen in the last six months. We can kind of divide that up over the last three months. And what we actually find overall is there's, there's pretty strong continuity. There's some breakups, these some little, um, a new formation, um, some breakups. So we're looking at people, this is just where we can see people, um, yeah, that, that are, where, where we can look at their continuity over the year, where, where someone didn't report a tie early on, but then, um, I'm sorry, this is the breakup here. So these are all breakups. Um, and what seems to stick out is what, so what leads to a sort of maintenance of ties over time? We find that, in fact, um, concurrency um, is associated with, with maintenance. So the more likely you are to have a concurrent partner, the more likely you are to actually maintain those partners over time. I'm not quite sure why that is. But also um, being local. So, so homophily, if you're um, partners from the same villages, you're more likely to see each other and maintain that tie over time, which makes sense. That seems, it seems like an easier thing to do um, if your partner is nearby. Um, but what I think is important here, this is a, a work in result, and we're not sure, you know, I think we need more data before we can do much with this. But what I think is important here is it shows how, even in these difficult times, when people are saying, it's hard to see my partners, I'm far away for a while, we actually see maintenance, um, la large maintenance over time. So people are still working hard to maintain these relationships, which shows their value, um, even in um, difficult times, even in the context of, of, of you know, high disease burden. And so um, just to wrap up, I just want to say that you know, this is a panel from um, a review paper, a great review paper by Joe Eisenberg and um, colleagues from several years ago. And they were, the, the point of the paper was to sort of talk about the different ways that we think about these sort of human diseases and their relationships with environment or vectors. And they sort of had this category of human communicable diseases just don't involve any kind of environmental interaction, which is, you know, our are human obligate diseases like gonorrhea, tuberculosis, these things that just kind of stick human to human. And, and this is the category that really just gets ignored um, from the disease ecology perspective. Um, but when you, I think because they're often not studied within the context of people who are immediately tied to their environment for their well being and for their livelihoods. And so um, we would argue that it, this really looks like this, right? That human behavior and um, epidemiologically relevant contacts are absolutely affected by human environmental interactions. And, and this happened, this, this changes um, on a rapid temporal scale, and it also, in a, in a predictable way, it all, also looks like it's, it's um, driven by a lot of these sort of new unpredictable things. We don't know what's going to be happening um, to um, 
human subsistence decisions when the environment just stops looking like what it once used to look like. Um, and so to do that work, I've um, been sort of doing some fun new collaborations with, I've mentioned Jack, um, Jamie Jones, who um, I'm in his lab as a research scientist. He was also my postdoc advisor. Um, um, Jeff and Alex are um, hydrologists at Stanford in the Earth System Science Department with us, and they're helping us do some more um, discrete measurements of the environment to actually look at how things are changing as people talk about how they perce perceive them to change and how their subsistence behaviors are changing. And Janssen Grad and his lab at Harvard who are helping us to expand the way we can do some molecular work. We're actually hoping that going forward this summer we're, we're going to try some new techniques where we, we think we can hopefully start to actually maybe get some do some culturing in the field, which would allow us to get samples where we can do some deep sequencing. We can actually start to look at strains and actually ask some of those questions about um, you know, how much strain variation is there? What kind of selection pressures might be operating? Um, is there any antibiotic resistance? Um, and how might that be driving some of these dynamics? So um, thank you so much for listening. First and foremost, always thank you to the participants who you know, actually trust us with all this this really private and very sensitive information, I'm, I'm endlessly grateful. And um, yeah, collaborators and funding and my, my support in Namibia. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Um, I was wondering, uh, did you collect any data on contraceptive use? Um, not really. So I, 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 I did ask um, in, in 2009 systematically about condom use. Um, I'm not really sure what I think of those data because I, I think people, you know, and especially going back to 2009, um, there was still a lot of, of just kind of talk in the air about HIV avoidance, right? Even though it wasn't, HIV is not a problem, it's not really a big issue there. It's just, you know, it's, it was on murals all over buildings, and there was still a lot of NGOs in the area. So I think me coming out and asking about that and asking about diseases, I, I really feel like people were biased to tell me what they thought I wanted to hear, even though I tried a lot of ways to ask about, like, you know, no judgment, just want to know what you do. I mean, plenty of people had no problem saying, I don't use condoms, I don't like them, I don't trust them, I think they cause disease. So I, I didn't ask about other kinds of contraception. Um, I, I don't think it's very common. You said you think it's growing a little bit, but do you think that's common use, or? Well, Renee asked this summer, so she, yeah. it's, it's, it looks, her data look different from mine in 2010, which are more similar to what yeah. you picked up in 2009. I mean, in 2009, people were saying, um, younger people were my, more likely to say I use them, or, um, oh, I only use them with the people, I, like my non-spouse, my non, my non right? And, but that's exactly what the public health messages were telling people to do. So I don't know if they were telling me that's like that's what I'm supposed to say or if that's really what was happening. I mean, I saw a lot of gonorrhea, particularly those high-tech infections in the young, younger community. So I just, I don't, also how do you get them, right? I mean, in these really remote villages, it's really hard to have them. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's changing a little bit. I, I just don't, you know, because the disease profile hasn't changed that much, there isn't HIV, I don't know that people are that that concerned about it. And, and definitely the, the HIV awareness has dropped just in terms of the, the big public efforts to talk about it. You don't see it and the NGOs aren't around anymore. So, yeah. But I'd love to find out more what you what you found. All right, let's talk about it. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you for a very interesting talk. Thanks. I was wondering if you, um, you could explain a little bit about um, how uh, whether I was curious whether symptomology was associated with like aversion to sex or other people's aversion to that person as a sex partner, right. um, like whether they were perceiving symptomology as in, as as that person being infectious, mm -hmm. and then whether there are any implications for um, like the pathogenic evolution of virulence or yeah. um, you know whether the if there were some sort of like aversion to a particularly virulent strain of the pathogen, whether it would continue to spread, but only these sort of like selectively yeah. less, uh, I don't know, overt symptomatic yeah. strains? Um, so uh, yeah, so the first part of your question I think is more about people's perceptions, and then the second is actually what might be going on in the microbiology. And um, So the first part, um, well, with, with herpes, no, right? Because herpes symptoms show up far away, 
from the infection, right? You, if you get if you get a seroconversion, you, know, you get you basically get the virus. You may not get the, the breakout won't happen for it could take up to a month. And so, in general, people even say they don't believe it's an H, it's a it's an STD, um, especially because they also they do know there's a link between a woman having like sores when she's pregnant or when she's about to give birth and a baby being born with fever. Um, not that anyone knows for sure if it's a men meningeal infection in the baby, but um, they definitely see that link. And so they'll say, well, babies get it, so it can't be an STD. So, so in that sense, no, they just don't recognize that. And also, I don't think that they often see those sores, especially on men. That's also just a, a general thing that's true, is it's harder to see those. With gonorrhea, most people, remember, don't recognize symptoms. They're rarely recognized symptoms. So it's hard to say because they just don't usually know that they're symptomatic if they are. With men, I would, yes, yeah, so men will say if they're symptomatic, they'll, they'll know it, and they'll usually have a plan to, they'll already have a plan in place to go get treated. So if we see someone that's symptomatic, we try to take them to the clinic, and half the time they're always like, oh, I'm going today, I've got to, you know, whatever. So they do want to go and get rid of it. It's quite painful. Um, a symptomatic gonorrhea infection is quite painful. It's, it, it, you get back pain, it burns, it's, it's, so, so there would be um, an aversion to sex, um, and people do try to get treated quickly if they are symptomatic. But back to the other part of the question, so how do people think about or avoid, we don't really know, and this is part of why a better microbiology, or, or uh, you know, getting, getting samples where we can actually culture and look at strains, would be so valuable because we don't know what's underlying all that asymptomicity. When I sort of laid out those three different kind of causes, and I would think that all of that's probably in the mix. But then what's virulence? And that's the other thing too that I just kind of, and even with, with um, Neisseria geneticis, we talk about this, like what do we mean by virulence? You know, because, um, you know, I think that like a big symptomatic infection, which is super painful, particularly if you can't get it treated, you know, that's going to eventually, the, the symptoms will go away, but what's going on in your body, what's, what kind of damage is that causing, these sort of secondary sequela, which can be quite dangerous. You can get, um, you know, ectopic pregnancy, sterility, um, I think we see a lot of um, um, impotence in men, um, all these really dangerous things. Um, but some might think, oh, but if, 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 you, if symptomatic infection, I mean, your immune system is reacting to it, it's dealing with it, it's shutting it down, right? It's, it's, where it's worse if it's evading your immune system. But we actually don't really know what, what's actually happening down the road if you, if, you, if you have an untreated infection, and one is from this very symptomatic purulent infection, and one is from one that's just kind of hiding out because it's evading your immune system. And that's, those, those characteristics are on a, can be on a strain basis, you know, the sort of uh, the gonorrhea's ability to evade immune system. But there's also a host component of that, which is obviously not happening on the same time scale. Um, certain receptors, variation receptors. So we just don't know. Um, and so hopefully we can say more. <laughs> so I don't know anything about the biology of gonorrhea. And um, I've been thinking about this. And what you just said suggests to me that this alternative possibility is at least plausible. And that's that. So you had, um, if I understood you correctly, you explained the calendrical changes um, in the frequency of high titer and low titer mm -hmm. um, as a function of the timing of new infections and then the subsequent diminution of the titer as the immune system successfully combats the infection. Um, but an alternative possibility is that the pathogen ecology includes multiple strains, um, some that are high virulent and produce high titer and some that are low virulent and produce low titer. And at points in the calendar when there are large social aggregations, the high virulent has higher fitness because mm -hmm. it's more easily transmitted by virtue of its virulence. Yeah. Um, and the, the low virulent loses out in that race, but then wins in relatively stable small network of partners, mm -hmm. long-term frequent population interactions. And so the seasonal fluctuations that you're seeing might not be a single strain um, in a single patient um, uh, undergoing changes in titer over time. They might be different strains mm -hmm. in different patients at different points. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's definitely, I mean, you know, to answer that question, again, you know, having strain information, actually knowing the variation, we don't know how much variation there is in this community, how much, how well that even compares to places where we have 
more detailed um, information about the kind of, you know, the actual kind of strain dynamics. Um, and so I, I definitely think that's, you know, also a possibility that all, all that stuff could be going on. Just like you say, there could be, I don't know how, like I said, gonorrhea does evolve very rapidly. And so there could be this kind of responsiveness and that short time period. Um, and without knowing how much variation there is at any time, we can't know, but I totally think that could absolutely be what's going on. And I think that's really important too from the point of view of like, you know, these kind of like, so in a normal year, right, when you have like, you've got your dry season and people go to the cattle post and then the rain season comes and everyone's, you know, working, um, possibly also still dispersed and then they come back a bit more aggregation in the winter. With droughts, what seems to happen is that um, people tend to hold out those dry period strategies longer. And so, you know, that, that decrease in the, the, con the, the in your access to con the, your partners would remain. And so in that window of time, presumably there's just less transmission because there's less sex, regardless of what strains are, are knocking around. But that would also, you know, if you drag that out, that's gonna also have a different selective pressure than if those windows are shorter. So there's a real kind of like population ecology thing that really like to do and and yeah and that's all so so the sort of the effect of the immune system and the effect of selection pressures based on the con the change of pressures I think are working together um, hopefully we'll be able to learn more about that if, if, if I could just very briefly follow up on that which is that, you know, I don't know enough about the nutritional stress that people experience as a function of mm -hmm. drought for example in this area but it seems to me that that makes the opposite prediction when it comes to the explanation of the change over time from high titer to low titer, because if in drought people are nutritionally stressed yeah. and have smaller numbers of sexual partners and less frequent interaction, right, mm -hmm. then the nutritional stress would favor an explanation that says, well, there's a, there's a slower decrease in titer, so you should see more high titer in drought Right? because people can less successfully combat the infection. Mm -hmm. But if it is instead a competition among strains or evolution of virulence within the host, which mm -hmm. are you know, different versions of the same argument, then the opposite should be in that the nutritionally stressed patient should none nonetheless be exhibiting a low titer strain because there are fewer opportunities for transmission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's also possible. The, the, the other thing to complicate that, though, too, is that you know, we're thinking about the immunity only from the point of view of adaptive immunity, and there's also innate immunity with gonorrhea. So there's this, you know, there are there's this sort of class of um, receptors um, called siglics, which um, can differentially, you know, gonorrhea can differentially bind to, and depending on um, which which version you have, and there's actually several types of siglics, and then within them there's variation. Um, you you basically either can can you know recognize the gon the gonococcus as it comes in, or you don't, and then you know that means you do or don't mount a you know an overt um, infection. So that and that wouldn't have anything really to do. I mean, it might have to do with how well you can respond to it, but it's certainly whether you have this evasive form or not. And 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 that was another thing we did with um, a group that studies. But they looked at my samples, um, and we found some. Variation, but we don't really know what that means, right? Like what's, what's the uh, is this is this something that maybe adapted in the in the um, human population a while ago because there was a lot of gonorrhea, and if so, what's the form that you know is 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 the sort of form that allows the, the gonococcus to evade more adaptive than the one that doesn't? So, yeah, there's this other piece to it. But you're right. I think that's a really really interesting things that we have to tease apart as we start to actually know more about the, the gonorrhea population. It's like, okay, so what are the actual predictions with how, how behavior of the host and how immune system of the host can affect the selective pressure acting on the gonorrhea? There's also my, the microbiome, right? There's also my, um, looking at microbiome dynamics and how that would affect it. And we think that that will be a, probably be a very different profile so of what we think we know about vaginal microbiome. So, yeah, thanks for this. Um, so you did this in multiple 
Yeah. 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 So I'll interview. Basically, I'll interview anyone that's there. If you live in Calcavel, like, like, at least most most of the year or something, um, we'll interview you. So. Because you know, if you're there, there's a good chance that you're connected to people, and if you're not, it'd be interesting to know why. So, so we look at Himba, Chimba, which are basically Himba, Twe, Hakona, Themba people, okay. some Avambos. So, other than the Avambo, I don't, I don't think that was much up. There's there's fairly substantial overlap, right, in terms of these norms of concurrency that you like you see it in. Yeah. Um, Although they don't bridge as much, you know. Not, yeah, so that was gonna gonna be what I was gonna ask, and also just the, I mean, interesting in terms of thinking about the networks. So at least where I work, right, it's Himba majority by a long, yeah. a large stretch, right? And so these other members of these other ethnic groups are kind of scattered within, mm -hmm. but they're within. And so I'm just wondering how, if you try to sort of think about what that means in terms of the transition rate to the other ethnic groups if you're, yeah. as opposed to being the, the majority ethnic group, which is minority one and things like that. Yeah. So we, yeah, we ask everyone about their tribal affiliation, so we can we can like look at. I have looked at disease status by that. I mean, Himba have higher disease rates. They also just, I think, and I think it has a lot to do with this, their their prominence, right, um, in the community. And there's they're they're more connected, they're more deeply connected to the network. So I think they're just at more risk in that way. If plague with gonorrhea, yeah. um, and so you, it just seems to be more. More prevalent and among Himba, and then Chimba, and then you know more so Twe. They're sort of more the periphery, yeah. and I have less of those in my sample. Those people in my sample because they're just less represented in the community. Yeah. Um, so I have I have a higher I can do better comparisons to so like Himba Chimba. And the, I worked in a couple places where there were a lot of Twe people, so I got there were some places where I had bigger pockets of that, um, but definitely less infection there. So I just think they're less they have less um, connectivity. Yeah. And then can I so the so so men get married a lot later than women, right? And so the the kind of proportion of marital to extramarital sex is going to look different, looking at women versus men, just by and so thinking about the age, you know, the sort of age effects and things like that, and, and how the dynamic might so. It's, I mean, we find a pretty strong mode of age of marriage for men in like their late 20s. Mm -hmm. And then to the point when they actually get a, a partner of reproductive, a wife of reproductive, yeah. it's a little bit later than that. And so if you, if, if, their strategies might shift at that point, right? Yeah. And so whether you would then see, I mean, they certainly still have these concurrent relationships, but the ways in which they utilize them might look to me like they might be quite different when you're like, 1920 versus when you're 30. Yeah. And how that, if you can actually, it'd be interesting to see if you can actually see a shift in the transmission dynamics mm -hmm. for men based on that, that kind of shift in strategy yeah. that you have in marriage. Yeah, um, I should look more closely with age at that because it's like, I haven't gotten great data on partners' ages, partly just because it takes so, you know, people don't know their own age is usually perfectly well. So there's a, you know, it's a series of questions to sort of get it in a range, right? And so then to do that for someone's partner, um, I've just kind of abandoned doing that very well, but it would, I think that's an important question because I can say like, oh, well, people don't change their, their number of partners all that significantly until they're pretty old, but I'm sure that the, the contact rates change. And so I do now have some, I have these, I could look at, I. Maybe not with their partner's ages, but certainly I could look. I could start to look at people's ages. Um, I haven't done that, but I think I've got the data, to do that, the small data, to do it. We can talk about and that. And your extramarital partner, the, in that, when you have the mixing uh -huh. matrices, but where it was like collisionous man, so it's not going. Um, the extramarital, you were only looking at unmarried extramarital partners, or were you also capturing married extra? Like if you have a lover who is all. So you're married and your lover uh -huh. is married. So I'm trying to go back, and I've got this thing popping up. Um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. So, mm -hmm. so were those captured in there, or is it only? Oh. Because like, is the polygynously married man versus non-polygynously married men, those are your, could either be your spouse or your lover? Yeah, so so basically what I did was, I realized I had to separate out. Um, you couldn't just, add, I couldn't just do this as like your partner, what your partner's marriage had. I'd be like, well, are they your spouse or someone else's spouse? Yeah. So I divided it up that way. So, so yeah, basically these counts are 
you know, your status, let me just use this, um, your status and then the status of your partner. So, so polygynously married man, you know, about 0.48% of their partners are of their a spouse, right? Uh -huh. Of course, zero here because you can't have a, your spouse can't be non-polygynously married if you were right. polygynously married, right? And then, oh, nobody does have, okay, so, but you could have a politically married extramarital partner. Sorry, that's the part I would think of. So it is captured. Yes, there. yes, yeah, exactly. Okay. So I broke up this who's your spouse and who's not. Yeah. And then, and especially in that case, it's like, well, if, you were, if, if, you're, if your partner is a politically married woman, but she's not your wife, um, you know, it, you're, you're, you're going to meet with her, but probably more in that opportunistic way if there's any kind of opportunity for frequent meetings, you know, because she's going to have a lot more obligations in her. There's going to be a little bit more of that kind of vigilance, which we, which we, we talk about not being really there, but of course it's there to some but extent. But less than right? if she's anonymous in there, yeah. because the husbands can switch between wives, yeah. right? And so do you see an effect of, like, is it stronger? You should have more yeah. contact with, with a polygynously married woman than a monogamously married woman. Maybe, unless her husband is around a lot, right? If it's like one of those marriages where you know, particularly if they're in the same compound, I think it, and these are based on pretty small data still, right? It's like I said, I feel like there's some, there's definitely a few outliers where it's like, geez, that really, that really messed up the contact count or something. But, um, but yeah, so, so the, that, that's something that, I've, and I also didn't account for, which you talk a lot about those like one night stand relationships. And I wasn't, I wasn't asking enough systematically enough, like, how old is this relationship? Like, I know how often you met that person in those six months, and if you met a lot, obviously it's not a one night stand, you're, you're more than that. But I don't know the, the, the length of that relationship, so I actually, I would have liked to have had a, like a, a category for one night stands, which I just was like, I had to, I had to just subsume that into the non-marital extramarital partner, because I, I just didn't have those good data, but, you know, doing this, I'm like, oh, this is, I've got to make sure I do that better next time, so I'll get that. Um, thank you for your talk. It was really interesting. I was wondering, um, I know you had said that people often go to the clinics and uh, fairly rapidly when they have... Um, if they can, people. yeah. Um, but I was wondering what your um, actions and considerations around, like, do you tell them what your results are? Do you guide treat? I was just yeah. curious about it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a really, it's, it's one of the difficult things about this is because so when we did herpes, when we did, we had that rapid test. So we could just tell them in the field, right? And that's, I mean, and that's, in terms of like the ethical implications of that, you know, and how people respond to that, you wouldn't do that with HIV, right? Like, you have HIV, good luck. Like, it was, that's terrible. But with herpes, it's not a big deal. People kind of like, oh yeah, whatever, I know, everyone's got it. Um, so we can tell them right in the field. Gonorrhea becomes really challenging because there's no rapid test. Um, there's no way we can tell people in the field. Um, and so we, what we can do is we can sort of facilitate the system that's already there. If someone's symptomatic or claims are symptomatic or if someone tells us their partner's symptomatic, we'll do anything we can to get them to the clinic. We'll take a day off work and just go to the clinic and do a, a clinic run. Um, so we do that. Um, we certainly, when we come back, I haven't actually done new gonorrhea testing in a while. So, but I mean, I see people that I saw, you know, years ago, we'll tell them about it again, or we, we go through old results and stuff. Now, the other nice thing, if we can do some of this um, infield culturing, you know, we don't know how well that's gonna work, and that might actually give us a lot of um, false negatives in the field, so, but it could improve some, you know, if there's people that are, are saying we're not symptomatic, but we can get, um, we can grow gonorrhea um, in the field, and we can see in the field that, they're, that we can actually intervene on that and help them get treated. Um, we're also we're sort of toying with the idea. There are some now some um, like in-field sequencing um, kits or like machinery that you can use. It's kind of these handheld sequencing. We're not sure if that'll work either, because because that, that will that would work. But the problem is you got to get you got to get the um, high concentration samples. You've got to still grow it up. So everything hinges on us being able to culture in the field, which means and gonorrhea is a pain because it um, requires a, um, a carbon dioxide rich environment. So you have to, um, the old school thing is a candle jar. You basically snuff out a candle in this like hermetically sealed um, jar and you just put a plate, a petri dish in it. But now there's actually some little like 
plates and we're going to try to do an infield um, traveling incubator and we're going to see if we can grow. If we can do that, we might be able to do infield sequencing. If we can do that, then we can tell people in the field, you know, and that would, you know, so we're working on improving that. Very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, thank you for your talk. I was uh, trying to get back to immunology, and mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to ask you about um, base rates of inflammation. I'm sorry, what? Uh, what? Inflammation. Oh, so okay. Like, you know, CRP, HSCRP, and things like uh -huh. that. Have you looked at that at all? And if not, could you speculate on how that would influence disease ecology? I haven't looked at it. Um, I don't know. I mean, so, so yeah, molecularly, we haven't looked at it. Um, and we're particularly we're thinking about um i think this sort of gets this sort of tangentially gets to your question um we know that microbiome dynamics would be important or should be important right and that sort of gets at what you're saying because some of those you know the profiles and of you know and, and the, the the changes and perturbances might say something about local immunity and um but that the, the way that you would structure collecting those data relative to how we get these data would be, we're still trying to iron out how to get the most value out of that. That also changes what we do because right now, you know, just from the ethical point of view and the IRB point of view, we're, we're going and we're bringing back, you know, we're only looking at um, gonorrhea DNA. We start doing that, we start looking at human information, which, you know, I believe we can do, right, but we just, that's a bigger hoop to jump through. We have to think really carefully before we start doing that. Um, but just sort of, you know, qualitatively, um, I think that it is, plays an important role. So you have high disease burden, you have dry sex practice, which I don't know if I mentioned that before, yeah. did I mention that? Okay. Um, and so, and also if there is frequent partner exchange, that's also been associated in other studies with high rates of, um, bacterial vaginosis, um, which is, you know, arguably like these disturbances in ecology, right, sort of this like higher upregulation of some of these sort of more, um, you know, non-commensal bacteria, although I think there's debate on what that really means. Um, so my, my assumption is that inflammation is probably, plays an important role, and that it's common, and that might be another reason why no one recognizes symptoms, because what does it mean to, yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Thank you again. Yeah, thanks. Okay, I think we're out of time. All right. Thank you.